have uh, Natalie Hutchinson, who is the director of Nationwide Children's Hospital Child Care. And we also have with us Carol Haynes, who is the president and owner of Kitty Academy. And we're gonna let them tell you um, some of the basics about their programs and then um, kind of what they've been working on. And then we, as Kat said, we do have a list of questions that were submitted. So we'll start to go through those. If you have additional questions or you need clarification, if you would just put those in the chat, that would be really helpful. We'll try to get to as many of those as we can. Um, if we end up running out of time and there are questions that weren't answered, we will uh, follow up with those after the presentation, okay? So don't think that we're skipping over you if we don't happen to get to your question, okay? So ladies, I don't know, Natalie, would you like to go first and tell us kind of about your program and how you've dealt with all these transitions and how are things going for you? Sure, I'd be happy to. So, um, as they said, I'm the director here at Nationwide Children's Hospital Child Care Center, and um, I've actually been in early childhood for about 40 years. So, um, a long time, I think I've done every job probably in the center from, you know, washing dishes to being you know, the, the uh, environmental service people, whatever. So we all know when you work in a child care center, you have to wear a lot of different hats. So we do. And currently, um, our center um, offers full-time child care for infants, toddlers, preschoolers, and we also have a kindergarten program. We opened a brand new building that can house up to 315 children on February 18th and then on March 18th oh, no. <laughs> we closed our building because we were the ones that you saw on the news that had the first case of a teacher with COVID and somehow the news found out about it and they were here that very next morning and um, to film the uh, pictures of the center actually it was on the 11 p.m. news and I didn't get the I think I got the news around six o'clock that evening. It was a long evening calling all the parents and speaking with people at the hospital. And, you know, we have the benefit of being here is that we have a lot of good resources, including medical folks that um, are the best and, um, you know, understand things as much as possible with this disease in particular, too. So, but it was, you know, it was one of the first really big cases in Columbus because that's when it really was just getting started. So that's a little bit about us. Um, I know that yesterday we talked about saying some things that was the most challenging to for this whole thing. Um, that was my most challenging evening ever <laughs> and telling parents that they had been exposed to this um, quarantining. Um, fortunately, we only had 12 kids in that class that day, so I had to quarantine 12 families at the time, some of who are docs at the hospital or work in different areas. So that was the most challenging. Um, and at that point, everyone was pretty scared because we didn't know a lot about this disease. So um, I think that was the most challenging night of my life. I think we were on the phone till about one in the morning calling everybody just to make sure we touched base because we did end up closing the center. So we had to let all the families know. And at that point, we had about 256 family, children. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so that was a lot of phone calls and a lot, a lot to do. Thank God for tadpoles. Um, but <laughs> anyways, the other, um, my, the silver lining is that this situation, I believe, has brought out the best in people. Um, I think teacher personalities are very creative and very, um, they just, they used to, we're used to going with the flow and having to switch gears a lot. You never know when someone's going to throw up in the middle of your classroom. So if it, they do, you have to switch gears and change what you were planning on doing. Mm -hmm. so, we're used to that, but this caused us to think a little bit more and problem solve a little bit more like and I think, you know, the protocols and the plans, and when I looked at the um, PowerPoint and some of the other photos and things people have sent in, I think there's the, there's the silver lining. The fact that we're all coming together to work, to keep children, to still offer services for parents, but keep children as safe as possible and um, just come up with some really um, great ideas to make this work. Um, and I know it's challenging. 
I, you know, I know we have advantages because we have big class. I have a lot of rooms and I have more space than most people. And I realize for small centers, it can even be more challenging. So um, I think the silver lining is though that we can pull together and we can help each other out. And programs like this, I think are the silver lining. Great, thank you so much for that. And Ms. Carol, how's everything going for you? Great. Um, I am Carol Haynes. I am the owner of Kitty Academy, um, several locations. And so I think um, we have several perspectives to kind of consider throughout the pandemic and the transition, uh, just because we have a smaller center in Hilliard. Um, and then we have an, a, a private pay center in Hilliard. Then we have a large center in Reynoldsburg with multiple locations that include um, a fairly large school age program and then two programs that operate um, in the schools during the school year uh, as well as a preschool school age building that is located on Tussing in addition to our Main Street location. We have this brand new um, center here right in the middle of downtown Columbus um, that much like Natalie um, we had a soft opening on January um, the 20th, had our ribbon cutting and celebration and um, on February 20th, and then on March 20th, uh, we were, were closing uh, for the pandemic. And, and it was probably um, one of the toughest things because we had put so much energy and time uh, into this program uh, to have to suddenly close it was really tough. Um, when we look at our, our numbers and families coming back, you know, one thing we know is that we've got to figure out, you know, how we restore the confidence of our caregivers um, because they want to return. I just think that not only our staff, but our families are scared. They're still, you know, they're still nervous. And so we're, we're working through how we restore um, that confidence. And so um, you know, we've had to give consideration to everything from, you know, how we fiscally can pivot and, and make sure that we're able to um, build a sustainable staffing plan that's going to get us beyond summer. And so when I say that, we know we can get through the summer, but it's looking at the fall and, you know, in October and November and December, you know, they look pretty hazy, you know, right now. And then just the idea of not, of not knowing. So working with our team and and you know, really trying to build what that model looks like. Um, I think that one of the other pieces for us is just really um, considering you know, each other. And so when I think of what was the most challenging piece while we thought moving to pandemic care because we operated a pandemic center in Hilliard um, and we operated a pandemic center in Reynoldsburg. So our main street location was open, but Tussing our school age programs obviously were closed. Downtown was closed. Um, and so we thought making that transition to pan, uh, pandemic care would be difficult, but it actually went fairly smoothly. Um, and I say that because I, you know, kind of tongue in cheek, you know, when I talked to our administrators, you know, we looked at our disaster plan and nothing in there said anything about a pandemic, pandemic care, anything like that. And so um, why I tell them all the time, you know, we're flying the plane while we're building it at the same time. So everybody has to be extremely patient um, but I think for me, the most challenging part was actually going from a pandemic back to transitional care because we were protected a bit by those one to six ratios um, and things being a little more um, controlled. And so not that they're not controlled now, but I think inviting in our families that were that are not essential workers has added um, a piece that we really we hadn't considered as we were making the transition. Um, for me, the, the most challenging part was furloughing my staff, um, having to look them in the face um, and tell them that they, we, we didn't have work for them. Um, and at the time, you know, we, we didn't have um, really an idea of even how long we would have to furlough folks. But the one thing that we knew is that we wanted to make sure that they had their health care insurance so that if they had an event while we were out or while they were off, that they could receive the care um, the health care that they needed or that their family needed uh, during that time. And so that was very key for us. Um, my silver lining or my kind of plus, because I've been doing plus deltas through this whole thing, 
is the collaboration, um, much like Natalie kind of mentioned, the collaboration that has really occurred amongst um, not only owners, but directors, um, staff. I've spoken to more owners and more directors uh, in the last probably four months than I have the entire time um, that I've been uh, in child care. And so that's been a plus. And then I think the add also is that uh, my team, my staff at all of our locations, their professional development level, um, their knowledge base has improved throughout this entire pandemic, whether it was from, you know, taking more elected type courses and classes to um, looking more at how we can, you know, meet the needs of our kids from a social emotional standpoint. And so we've grown really in that, in that realm. And so we're, we're proud of that. Um, and we hope to continue to grow. Um, as we move through this transition. Great, thank you so much for sharing. So are all your sites open now? Not yet. So okay. um, <laughs> we have, um, our school age programs are closed until school starts and we have right. some collaboration that we'll need to do with the uh, superintendent and business manager there to figure out even what that is gonna look like. Um, we've started to put some things together and our downtown location will open on July the 6th. Um, okay. And so the, the, the reason for that was just, there's a lot of businesses that aren't bringing folks back to work until July, um, but we do still have some large employers down here that aren't returning folks to work until after the first of the year. Um, where we're seeing an increased need is from some families that are being, and I know we'll probably talk about this a bit later, but kind of being closed out of their centers uh, right mm -hmm. now. So they're um, securing space because it's close to work. Absolutely. And Miss Natalie, are you, how's your capacity looking these days? So we started out very slow. Um, we did not do, we had the pandemic license, but we never used it. So okay. we opened back up, um, it's been, I think, three weeks ago, or four, four weeks ago. And we started with 12 infants. Um, so we had two Sorry. classrooms of infants. And um, then we went, two weeks after that, we went, we added 40 or 40 more. And we were up to, actually we were up to 54 children. And Monday, this coming Monday, the 29th, we're adding about 45 more. So we're gonna be at around 100. My capacity is, um, like I said, a little over 300. Okay. Um, and so my staff was, I had some staff that were still working and still doing some in-home care, but I was able to call back, probably half my staff is back now with this next, um, with these ratios and this next group that's coming in. And I can totally um, echo what Carol said, furloughing people was really, really difficult. And um, I'm sure we were the hospital was able to maintain their salary for about six weeks, and then after that, they had to you know, go on unemployment. And so that's been you know, that was difficult. And um, so, but we're getting there slowly. The gradual <laughs> increase is <clears throat> okay. So, I'm just going to launch right into the questions that we kind of led into that anyway. We're going to start with staffing. Um, how are you managing staffing for breaks, planning time, extra cleaning? To either one of you, whoever wants to. Go ahead, Carol. Oh. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so for us, we have um, several floaters. Um, we hired folks that we were not aligning to the classroom to address breaks. Um, and so um, one of the things we do is just require that there's only one staff member in the break room at a time. Um, they wash in and wash out. Um, that means, um, you know, washing their hands as they enter, cleaning all surfaces um, prior to use, um, cleaning all surfaces again, um, washing out um, on those nice days, they're mandated to eat um, outside at the tables outside. And then um, on the rainy days, again, just one person in that specific um, break room. I think um, Staffing wise, we've been trying to really meet the needs and it's kind of been on an individual basis. And so um, folks were able to come back and help us out some part time because um, they've had some additional care needs uh, personally at home. So maybe they're caring for an elderly 
a mom or individual that may have otherwise gone to adult daycare um, so they can work a part-time day and we're flexing in another part-timer. Um, we are also trying to make sure that we're using the same floater in the same classrooms, meaning they've kind of got a pod of classrooms they're responsible for. And then when you go in that classroom on the hook, they've got a smock that's their floater smock in that space. Um, and so we're trying to kind of cut down on cross-contamination maybe that may occur on their clothing. Uh, we really looked at trying to go disposable, but the cost it was cost mm -hmm. prohibitive for us. The cost of down right now has truly increased. And then mm -hmm. we got three orders of gowns, but I paid different prices for all three shipments. Um, and so it was really hard to even create a budget on what that cost would be. So we went to um, smocks that are signed to um, each floater in their pod of classrooms um, and no one's to wear that and we wash them daily. So we're able to do breaks that same way um, with that same floater um, as well. And so that's been effective uh, for us. Yeah, and ours is very similar to that. Um, we assign, it's usually two teachers with the infants, it's three teachers to the classroom. They work staggered shifts, they social distance in the room. And then we have, we're, we're trying to work everybody pretty much straight eights. My teachers like that anyways, because it gets them, it shortens their day a little bit. Um, and then they just eat in the classroom with the kids and they social distance. We're using all disposable too in the classrooms for eating. Um, then we have a floater that's assigned to, we have one or two floaters for each age group. So, um, and one will work 6.30 to 2.30 and then the other one works 9.30 to 5.30. So we have a floater there all day for the infants, a floater for the toddlers and a floater for the preschoolers all day. We are also using, and I think there's a, a picture in there, we're using um, scrub jackets is what they are or scrub pullovers because the jackets were a little, Warm, and we just got a whole bunch of as cheap as we possibly could because we looked into the disposable as well. Very expensive, even with the hospital discount, very expensive. So we um, bought them in all different sizes. We keep them in the front when you arrive in the morning, when you take your temperature and you get your mask on and you, um, so you get your mask on and you take your temperature. And you, you bring your goggles because we gave everyone a pair of goggles. Then you choose your um, scrub top or your scrub jacket, put that on. Um, and we have lots of different colors and it's kind of, that's kind of fun. And if you get soiled anytime throughout the day, we um, keep a laundry basket. They just throw it in the laundry basket and then we wash them in a really um, heavy bleach solution every night so that they're so that's what my teachers look like at, when they go into the classroom so and you know I think that was my biggest fear was that the kids were going to be really freaked out when they saw these people that with these different outfits on and these goggles and these um, uh, masks but actually the kids could care less <laughs> and um, it's funny I've talked to other directors about that and they've all, we've all kind of felt the same way so but it does seem to be really effective to keep everybody in an assigned group keep teachers in their classroom as much as possible all day we even have restrooms that like we have a cluster of restrooms that are for the infant teachers on the south end of the building. And then there's a restroom for the infant teachers on the north end of the building, however it is. So everybody kind of uses the same restroom. And in the restroom, we keep a bottle of Virex, which is something we get from the hospital. But there's so many things that kill COVID. I, I mean, they say any, most cleaners do kill it. So, you know, we spray the back of the toilet after we're done, we spray the um, handles on the sink the door handle and those light switches. So it's just a little routine we, you know, have the teachers do, same as when the children are using the restroom, they're spraying after each use. So those are just some things that help keep us safe. And um, we had the luxury of having an epidemiology department. They came over and walked through with us and went over everything they were doing. They were really quite pleased. They helped me write the protocol, and I did send that protocol on to Kat and Melinda. Have, they should have it. If anybody wants a copy of it, you're welcome to it. Great. Thank you so much. And I, I think everybody saw Kat was sharing the picture that they sent over there of everybody dressed up in their little outfits. <laughs> I like the scrub idea. That's a, that's a good idea, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about um, 
you can just wash them all together at the end yeah. of the morning. Um, do you have any uh, other opinions about how are you managing vacation times or if someone had to take off or maybe if they'd been exposed and had to be quarantined, how are you gonna manage time off for your teachers? Um, we, our plan heavily uses our floaters for that so that we don't feel you know, extremely obligated or, or the staff don't feel like they've gotta try to come in because there's nobody else to come. Um, we've mm -hmm. been heavily pushing staycations. Uh, so any approved vacations, you know, we're continuing to honor that. I um, mean, honor that time just because we know that staff, it's very important that they get those breaks and, and get that time away. Um, we are, are looking at where they're going and what they're doing when they're off as much as they're able to share that information. Um, and so we're relying on them to kind of self quarantine as needed based on what they're doing and where they're going. And so, you know, if they're asking for a week off um, and, you know, the first part of that time frame, they went out of town, um, they've got to self quarantine according to where they go. Um, and that could be up to, to 15 days. Um, you know, it may be up to seven days, depending on um, what they did and how long they've already been gone or have returned back from that space, just because we know the science is really saying that day eight is important from the time frame that you've had um, and exposure. So we're making decisions based um, off of that. Um, we've gotten questions from staff like, hey, how long are we gonna have to do this? Uh, and so what we're really looking at um, when you watch um, the reports and, and look at the dashboard that the state puts out there, we're looking at that are not um, that's discussed and we're gonna make decisions based off of that. And so, you know, as that number declines or decreases, we may talk about um, how we transition out of that quarantine, but based off of the science and the data, we're gonna continue to keep those timelines in place, but allow staff to go on vacation. Yeah. Um Ours is very similar to, we, we definitely are allowing staff to take days off, go on vacation. We use the floaters that work with that age group, so there's no additional exposure. Um, we, you know, we are encouraging them to take mental health time, especially if they need it. The hospital has a very strict travel policy, so if you fly on an airplane or you go to any hotspots, and as we know, the hotspots change every week, you, um, you need to be quarantined for 14 days. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're just really clear about that. And everybody knows that up front and they check the hotspots. And to date, no one has asked, has flown anywhere. So we're in the hospitals doing no business travel. So it's pretty much across the board. So it doesn't seem to be hard to enforce. I think the biggest thing is just giving them their time off when they need it. And if they're gonna travel somewhere in a car, as long as it's somewhere you know, that, that is not a hot spot. Um, and I think most of our, most people are being very cautious anyway. So um, that hasn't, has not really been an issue with us at all. I think it's important though for morale, this is such challenging times and people mm -hmm. even need mental health days. So I think it's really important to make sure they can still use their pay time off. One other thing, I, I didn't say yeah, this please. before, but I, I think this is really important to share with everyone is that when we were talking about um, keeping everyone safe and ways to do that, and uh, the don we call it at the hospital, they call it donning and doffing your PPE. And so it's, um, uh, so we're doing that. But the other thing that we did that I, it might be unique to our center, it might not be, I'm not sure. But most child care centers have a lot of doors because they have doors with the kids on the first floor where they can just go straight outside. And what's really working well for us is that they pull into the parking lot, we take the child's temperature in the car seat, um, and then that they park closest to their door and then they go in their door and no one is coming in the front doors except the kids on the second floor and that would be my preschoolers. They come in, a teacher gives them a little hand sanitizer, they hand sanitize and they walk upstairs and, and then they wash their hands when they get to that room, but their parents don't come in. And the use of all those doors and then the teachers are constantly, I have cleaners that go around and clean, plus the teachers are wiping, wiping off door handles and that kind of thing. Parents are required to wear a mask at pick up and drop off. 
So just all those little extra things. And, um, you know, when I look at child care centers, most of them do have a lot of doors. And when I, you know, the fact that we have a door for every infant and toddler room really is advantageous at this point. So they're walking outside, mm -hmm. we're not in a building, we're not confined. So shared space is something that we just aren't doing. We're not using shared space at all. No indoor muscle room, nothing like that. So. Got it. Kat, do you wanna put up the, the slides about um, the check-in slides that we have? Um, while she's doing that, let me just ask you, we had a follow-up question in the chat about have either of you or both of you, are you able to pay your staff for the time that they take off? Or if somebody would have to quarantine, is that paid time? Um, so the, the new federal um, guideline actually provides about six buckets that you can look at regarding um, the uh, Family uh, First Cares Act out there. Um, and so it does allow us to pay staff anytime they need to self-quarantine is one of those buckets that are out there that we can use to code that. Um, and so uh, we are utilizing that. Uh, and at the end of the year um, on the, the business side of it, once you have that coded correctly, you can get a tax credit for that time. And so while you know, we wanna kind of amp up our empathy for our staff and our team and make sure that they're paid for that um, time as well, they wouldn't have otherwise had to take it if it was not for the coronavirus. Um, but on the business side, we are able to receive a tax credit um, if we make sure we document that appropriately. Great. Yeah, and being under the, the umbrella of the hospital, all staff is paid if they're quarantined or for paid time off. As long as they have paid time off, they accumulate it. Um, anytime they're on vacation or take days off or whatever, they get paid. Um, but for quarantine, we do have a special coding and they do get billed or they get paid. And, you know, that's the beauty of we're in a unique situation and we know we're lucky that we have those mm -hmm. resources. Sure. Um, I thought it was really interesting what you were saying about each of your classrooms has its own door that people can arrive directly to mm -hmm. each classroom. Of course, not every center is gonna have that right. option. So I just wanted to show, we had a couple examples here of how here at Southside Early Learning Center, they have the parents walk up to the lobby and then they have, of course, the, the floor is marked at six feet intervals um, and they step up to the table, they get their hand sanitizer, um, they have their nice rules listed out there so they can take everybody's temperature and, and make sure we're um, taking our time at the um, pick up and drop off there so we don't get too crowded. So I just wanted to show that real quick. And we do um, something very similar to that. Um, okay. Uh, Hilliard, they actually have just just like Southside, looks like that X is on the, the floor and the ground outside because one family um, only in the vestibule area. However, in Reynoldsburg, um, families remain in their vehicle. Um, and there's a team of staff that go and grab the students. Um, one of our learnings from that was we were bringing the children in and then scanning them for temperature. Um, and so we had one student that caused us to to rethink what we were doing because now we need to um, actually scan them while they're in the vehicle because once we got them in the building, that parent has pulled away. So we want to make sure right. that we have that screening process um, complete. That was our aha moment. <laughs> so to the drop off is working really very well mm -hmm. uh, with that. You know, I like the idea of the doors, but I'll tell you, we were when we kind of vetted it out, um, the kids aren't used to seeing people come in and out of the door. Um, and the way that we've had to set barriers in the class, um, one of the staff had brought up, you know, it would make it really hard for me to get to that door from over here if the kids start getting used to coming in and out of it. And so um, the call was made to keep our one entrance. Um, you know, we never really want to cross that threshold um, unless we're just going in and out of it for fire drills. So um, that's what we chose to do there, but I think it's a good idea if folks can make it work and they're comfortable with the safety, the safety portion of it. Sure, I think that's important. That's an important point too, that just because you have made a policy mm -hmm. and that it has to stay that way, if it's not working or it's taking too long or it's too cumbersome, you know, there's always room to change and try something else. Um, 
I was on a call uh, Tuesday and the, the, the director that was talking was saying that, um, that they had all these great ideas written out in their policies and they had already updated their handbook and everything was all great and happy written out. Um, but when it came down to it, they got a lot of feedback from the parents. That they didn't feel comfortable with the way that it was going. So they had to kind of redo the whole thing. And they were happy to do it because they want the parents to feel safe and comfortable. Mm -hmm. so. It's funny you say that. I just talked to my Hilliard director this morning about doing a survey monkey out mm -hmm. to the parents to get feedback just to kind of take their temperature and see how they're feeling and and really just evaluate if there's anything we need to do differently or any, you know, just anything we need to address. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they're getting a little more face time because they do come into the, the vestibule, mm -hmm. um, but we still want to see, just see what, what they're thinking. Great, great. Um, so kind of while we're on the subject of sanitizing and cleaning, um, what is your process for cleaning and sanitizing toys after each use? What does that mean to you after each use? Um, I mean, I think that it, it means, it could mean after each child, it could mean after each, you know, classroom, if we're talking on the playground. Um, but I tell my staff, if, if you think it should be clean, clean it. So, mm -hmm. you know, you're on that side, right. um, always between um, use of students, we have um, kind of separated as much as we could separate into students having their own crayons, their own markers, um, any of their, their own items that we could put in their bag, um, we have done so, uh, so that that kind of assists the, the staff um, and have added colored duct tape on markers. So your markers are always with the red tape so that you know they know that that's their color. Um, and so that works obviously for preschool school age students a bit more than our toddlers. Um, <laughs> and so, um, but anytime that they believe that we should be cleaning, um, we've instructed them to do so. Yeah. Err on the side of caution. And um, we took a, most of the soft things out of the classroom. And if we do have any left in there, that like the boppies and that kind of thing, those are washed daily. We have a lot of covers, so we just switch them out. Um, mm -hmm. We have a couple, well, we actually have six commercial, seven commercial dishwashers, I think. So we throw things in there daily. If a toy is mouthed, as soon as it comes out of that child's mouth, it goes into a bucket. And um, then everything in that bucket is washed before it's put back out again. And, you know, same thing with I see, you know, what the teachers are doing, they're washing the Legos and the blocks and any small toys that they're, anything building wise, they're washing them and then they, um, dump them out onto towels and then the next morning when they come back and they just put them back in the bucket. Great. Sanitizing, I think people also sanitizing the buckets that things are in is important as well as sanitizing those laundry baskets. So I know that was on um, one of the things I think we got from ODJFS, but I think that's something we all need to remember is to sanitize that part too. Sure. So Kat is showing some examples that were sent in um, from different places of ways to kind of separate out the individual um, just activities that the kids are doing and things that they're touching. So it can hopefully cut down a little bit on how, like if everything is kind of separated, as you said, you could mark it for that particular child or, um, or just say you can only touch stuff that's on your tray. You want to show some of the other ones? There, Kat. Um, while we're talking about sanitizing and, and looking at those examples, you see we have the kids kind of spaced mm -hmm. out there, the water bottles are spaced out. <laughs> um, how are you dealing with sanitizing wooden blocks or toys? And also along with that playground equipment that maybe wouldn't like not easy to just kind of spray down. Do you have um, suggestions for that? Um, playground equipment is difficult <laughs> um, just because we also want to keep in mind um, from a cost perspective, our utilization of our, our cleaning supplies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they are um, intermittently, so they have times where they're going out um, where no one can use the playground um, and they're using mop buckets. Um, and so they're using a disposable mop to actually clean the slide, clean materials, 
spray it down and then sanitize it and allow it to air dry. Um, and then they are spraying it down just between groups with sanitizer and allowing it to sit the 10 minutes that it's required. So there's typically about 15 minutes between um, each specific group. Um, the other piece that we made sure that we did, we really worked with our cleaning company to just evaluate their processes and procedures um, at close down each night um, so that we could look at how they um, are doing that. Um, wooden blocks in most of the classrooms have come out um, just because it's pretty hard to submerge them um, without mm -hmm. damaging them. Um, the amount of times that we would need to do that um, between students. And so we're not using those wooden blocks um, Got it. Right now. We still are using the wooden box, but we kind of have an advantage over everyone too, because we have a product called Virex that we can purchase through the hospital um, that kills all of those things. And you, we spray it, we use it on the playground in between each classroom and we use it on blocks and that kind of thing in the evening. And some of the wood blocks are have a little bit of a coating on them and you can still wet them. We also use some, we have some hospital grade wipes too that we use. So okay. yeah, Great. so Lysol wipes I think would do the same thing, um, but just as much as you can. And I had thought about, I'm gonna try this adding, doing the, the bleach water solution. I don't know if you guys have ever cleaned your windows with the Windex stuff that you screw on your hose and it kind of turns your hose into a power washer and you just spray it and then you rinse it. Mm -hmm. And there's a rinse and a spray on it. Um, so I thought about just getting, taking one of those empty bottles and trying putting bleach in there with the water and spraying things down with that. That would be a really fast way to get them mm -hmm. instead of going around spritzing everything, so. Sure. Uh, speaking of bleach, we have an example here showing on the screen of a way to kind of separate a sense mm -hmm. of activity instead of of having everybody in one big sensory table, we might do like kind of shoebox size mini sensories. Um, and someone had submitted the question about is it okay to add bleach to water if there was water play going on? What do we think about that? Um, the directive is no, um, because the amount you would have to add is too much. Relating to like Carol, that's what you've heard to correct. It is. Um, yeah, yeah. We, the, the amount that you would have to add per gallon is not a safe level. Um, right. For children to play in or ingest. So um, I think when we listened to Suzanne on Tuesday, her her directive or her instruction was no. Right. Yeah. Suzanne from ODGFS, yes. Right, exactly. Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. Um I'm trying to make sure we hit a bunch of the different questions. We still have several to go here. Uh, do you have any tips for helping children wear masks or better do the children wear masks? And is it at a certain age or is it just on entering and leaving or how are, how are you dealing with masks as far as the children go? Well, um, I can tell you the hospital will say children under two should never wear a mask. Right. Um, we are not doing masks. I'll defer to Carol to see what she's doing. Our groups are small. We're trying to eliminate the exposure. So, so teachers, teachers, yes. Children, no. Children, no. In our program, yes. Okay. Carol? Okay. Um, teachers, yes. Some, some children are wearing masks, um, and that is the comfort level of their um, caregiver. Um, but what we're doing is introducing it to them in the dramatic play area. So trying to make it Part of say like a superhero costume or such. Sure, that's a great idea. Um, but mm -hmm. several and several kids are are wearing them. I have a two year old granddaughter, and I don't care what we do or where it's introduced, she is not putting on a mask, and she would prefer that her teacher not wear a mask. Um, and then you know, as far as the teachers wearing masks, I've had a few parents, and they're primarily infant parents. Um, really ask us to reconsider that or to look at an alternative. So we've um, ordered off of Etsy, some of those masks with the clear mouth cut out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because they're worried about their babies not seeing emotion or expression. Mm -hmm. So sure. we want to give them that option. And then uh, my daughter is actually um, hearing impaired. Uh, and so I, when someone mentioned that, I was all over it because she's a lip reader. So. Mm -hmm. 
um, you know, it, to be more inclusive. Um, and we have a couple hearing impaired parents in Reynoldsburg. Um, to be inclusive, we want to make sure that that's an option that's available for them as well. So it may not be something they use every day, but it's there if the teachers have a, a parent that has a preference such as that. Great. I'm hold, hold up a communicator mask that you can purchase these two. They're expensive, but mm -hmm. this is one of the communicator masks. Okay, so they can okay. see so your can smile. See, yep, you can yeah. see the yeah. lips. And we use this in our infant rooms, you know. Yeah. So that is an option. And you can buy some that people actually make too. And I saw a question pop up under the chat that was, can somebody confirm what Suzanne said mm -hmm. about math? And um, at this point, they are, correct me if I'm wrong, Carol, but not required, correct? Strongly right. recommended, not required. I think for your comfort level of your parents, um, and you know, I know I'm in a unique situation because I work with a lot of clinical parents and people that work in healthcare, and they're adamant about the mask. But I think it makes parents feel much more comfortable in general, even though it is sometimes an adjustment for the children that the masks protect them from the exposure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I have a an. Um, older staff member who came to me and said that she's early COPD um, and the mask caused her a problem. So mm -hmm. we her more frequent breaks, um, but as we've asked her to, to don it when possible, um, and then when she needs a break to call out, but if she needs to take it off before that floater gets in there, by all means to take it off. Um, but mm -hmm. we're, we're ensuring that all of our staff have a mask um, at all times while they're in the building. Um, and I would be, remiss if I said that they're I haven't caught people wearing it below their nose mm -hmm. right <laughs> you have to remind around the chin yeah. chins yeah. are really well yeah. protected yeah exactly <laughs> take it off because it's not effective so you know yeah. right consistently reminding our team that you know in order to keep them safe and everyone else safe it's got to cover their mouth and their nose great yeah. I just want to take one second sorry uh Natalie just one second uh, on Tuesday, uh, Suzanne referred several times to a toolkit that's available, um, and I'm mm -hmm. sure we post it here, or it'll be in um, what's forwarded on our website, and um, it does list very specific recommendations and what, what are our rules, what are recommendations, mm -hmm. um, and someone in the chat asked about a parent information letter, like a release sample letter. Um, and there definitely is one of those in there. If you are kind of unsure about how to explain these policies and procedures to the parents, that they definitely have given you an example for that. Oh, looks like she just put it in the chat. Okay, what were you gonna say, Natalie? I'm sorry, I cut you off. Oh, I keep seeing the question pop up about the release statement for COVID. If we have a release statement saying if your child's exposed or gets it here that you mm -hmm. can't, basically, we don't have anything like that. Um, I don't know if Carol does. I, I don't know of anyone that has such a thing. I, you know. Well, I know that several people do have them. Our release is not necessarily a liability waiver that we're mm -hmm. to support us in court. It's more of um, confirming that they've been educated regarding the risk mm -hmm. that are involved with their return, um, that they are aware of what our policies and procedures are um, related to uh, COVID. Um, related to, um, you know, for instance, if we send home kids, we're pretty strict. Um, you know, if they come, it's not just respiratory symptoms, you know, if they have GI symptoms, if they're vomiting, if they've got diarrhea, they're out mm -hmm. 50 days, there's no explanation. You can tell me they're teething. You can tell me they have an ear infection. It, pretty much anything other than pink eye is out 15 days, whether they are a staff member or whether they are a kid, it's not even worth discussing because when we get finished, mm -hmm. it's still 15 days. And so, that waiver is just really them understanding that that's the new process, that's the new procedure. There are risks inherent with bringing your child to a child care center in the middle of COVID-19, and that paper just acknowledges that you're aware of that. Sure, and I think a, a lot of us, as Susan, Suzanne pointed out on Tuesday, a lot of you are used to having to notify about communicable diseases in general. Um, so just thinking about how you have done that in the past and kind of adding in, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you have to do some kind of notification or if you have to not, um, just let parents know we're doing this because we have this additional risk now, um, you can kind of 
not have to reinvent the wheel. You can use what you were kind of using before and just add to it. And with all the testing centers now, tests are so readily available now. If you have a concern about a child uh, before you let them return, if it, you know, if I think it's totally appropriate if you say, you, you know, you'd like them to be te tested or if they're just keeping them home, you can ask that, I think. They don't have mm -hmm. to do it, but you don't have to let them back in either. So it's, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, I have kind of a funny one. We're running a little short on time, so I want to make sure I get the last few questions in here. Um, how do you feel about singing indoors without spreading the virus? How can you have preschool without singing? What do you feel about that? Well, you can sing with your mask on it, on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay. my teachers are still singing with their masks on and so much of what we do, I mean, transitions, we sing for a transition. We sing to the babies when we're rocking them to sleep. Mm -hmm. we, sing, we sing still with our mask on. Now, maybe we don't sing quite as boisterously as we used to, <laughs> but we still sing. So, and the kids still sing. So yeah. we're singing at this point. We're <laughs> <So> good. <Carol. laughs> yeah. <laughs> What'd you say, Carol? I'm sorry, I missed it. I said we're singing too. So oh, good. No, okay, good. Place no restrictions on our our children or our staff related to to singing. And and much like Natalie said, you know, I can't think of. I mean, probably sixty percent of our transitions mm -hmm. involve the teacher singing. Sure, I think that's important too to think about as we're thinking about being safe and careful. We also have to think to still have fun and the mm -hmm. really small kids who need to see smiles, who need to see singing and fun activities and go play outside. Um, we can't forget about that part too. Good. Mm -hmm. um, another section that uh, we had several questions about meals and snacks. How have you adjusted? Uh, one of you mentioned that you're using all disposable. Um, very green, but we are using sure. we're using paper disposable, not styrofoam, but we are using disposable. And uh, we are just taking the food directly to the classroom. Only the only person that touches it mainly is the cook, or we may have one other person that delivers the gloves, the mask, all of the food people have on the mask all day, the gloves, the hair nets, all of that. We're just being super duper safe with that. Um, and then we're lucky because we do have those really high temperature dishwashers. So we're able to put the serving containers in that. We are not eating family style right now. Yeah. It, it's scooped out on the plate and we are trying to distance the kids as much as possible um, when they're eating a meal. So. Got it. Um, and for us, two of our three open buildings are using disposable. When downtown opens, they'll use disposable. Um, you know, we have, we went from having about 90 kids a day to 268 um, at our main street location. Uh, and so when you look at disposable and that cost increase, we just weren't able to make that work right now, um, just quite yet. Um, and so uh, we are not using disposable there. Um, family style dining, just much as Natalie has said, has ceased. And then we distance the students, um, you know, one on each end of the table. Um, during lunchtime to make sure that they're appropriately distanced as well. And so, you know, it's different. Uh, the kids mm -hmm. are resilient um, and have kind of bounced, um, been able to kind of rebound from that. Um, our carts don't go directly. The cook doesn't push them in the classroom anymore. The teachers are grabbing them from the hallway to kind of decrease the cook from going into that space um, as well. So we're trying to reduce exposure as much as possible with that. Uh, but, you know, it, it helped us realize the value of family style dining and what mm -hmm. it to us. Um, it's and so, strange, yeah. yeah, missing those, those large, you know, the group conversations and, and sure. some of that piece. So interesting. I'm just interested as you have spaced the kids out at lunch or snack or whatever. Um, does that mean that you have to do kind of two rounds of lunch or something? Like, are you, go ahead. Yes, um, so to speak. Um, but they've, they've been really good. The teachers have tried to kind of buddy them. So they're kind of eating lunch with their buddy. Um, and then, you know, we've got group one, group two, group two. I think we've got three shifts, really. Um, okay. In each of the classrooms, uh, just to make sure that we're able to maintain the temperature of the food appropriately. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, you know, obviously been a little bit different. 
So it just yeah. kind of speaks to, you know, this, I mean, really the teachers are running at a relentless pace right now. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I think some of the stress that comes with that and just kind of being mindful of, you know, that's that mental fatigue that's happening to them because they are doing things differently and they're, they're working hard to do it right. So. Yeah. Yeah. We, we're, we haven't had to do that because our numbers are, our rooms are big enough and we have enough table space that we can socially distance them and have them all eat at the same time. So we're just kind of lucky right now. That may change as we get more children. So. Okay. Okay. Um, let me see. I want to make sure I hit as many as I can. So I don't know, I know, Ms. Carroll, you said you have after school programs that haven't opened yet, but someone submitted, I'm looking for insight into how to run a before and after school program, which allows children to drop in. Mm. What adjustments are you making for the fall or school age? Have you thought through that yet? I have, and I'm going to tell you, um, so we, we have Hilliard um, and they service Hilliard schools. We have Riddlesburg and we service, you know, six different school districts. Um, and so we are really kind of waiting on the edge to see what folks are going to do. Um, I've heard a little bit um, kind of leak out from different districts. Um, but one of the things is before and after school wise, you know, maybe the child is considering the child is fine when we check them in, but we get them to school and they have a fever. What happens with the student? Who's responsible for them? Um, we go to pick them up from school. Um, they're going to check their temperature prior to boarding the bus. If that student has a temperature um, or things have changed, do they get on the bus? Do they stay at school? Mm -hmm. What's the expectation of the district? Mm -hmm. um, we've looked at whether or not districts are going to have A, B days, meaning they'll be there Monday, Wednesday um, with us or Tuesday, Thursday. Then we would have both those groups on Friday. So we're lo looking to set um, probably three or four different rosters, but have pretty much a drop-in classroom. Um, for those students that may only come on Fridays or they may only need to come um, one day a week, but to keep kind of that cohort still together. And we recognize that that group size on the roster may be 12 kids, but each day it may never exceed nine, but that's their mix and will be their little tribe, um, so to speak. And then, um, you know, looking at programming even outside of our buildings, um, making sure that we build some processes with those building uh, principles to make sure that we're able to implement 